I'm Keith Cambron, and this is a three-hour course called How the Internet Works. The, each hour is broken into four 15-minute sections. The first section is entitled Network of Networks. The diagram you're looking at was uh, created by crawling the web and recording each point or address on the Internet. It was done several years ago, about five or six years ago. It's available at opti.org slash maps. It illustrates uh, the richness of the Internet and various uh, subnets or domains are represented by different colors on the map. And it shows us uh, some of the characteristics of the network. In particular, that the network is extremely dense and rich and that it is non-hierarchical. Uh, in a large sense. There are some hierarchies involved <clears throat> in the way the uh, networks are organized, but in general there's no specific hierarchy like there is in the telephone network. All of these networks are bound together not by common underlying technology, but by the Internet Protocol or Internet Protocols. Um, IP Protocol, Internet Protocol is a specific protocol for communications and connectivity uh, but there are many uh, protocols that ride on top of that or are associated with it, uh, hundreds of them in fact, uh, and they all are able to communicate with each other because they rest upon this common foundation called the Internet Protocol. There are billions of users and devices on this global network uh, at millions of sites, homes, uh, businesses, uh, retail outlets, uh, mobile devices, and there are thousands of network operators. One of the really remarkable aspects of the Internet is that it was not designed from the top down and it's not controlled by a central agency, but rather is uh, a federation of uh, thousands of these network operators, uh, some of them service providers, others are communications companies, and they, they work with each other in a cooperative way because of the standards that are built around the protocol they use, that is the Internet Protocol. It is not only designed uh, through cooperation, although each network operator designs their own network in a way that suits them, in a larger sense uh, it is a co collaborative design that uses these protocols and the interconnection between networks is done in a very formal and uh, structural way that enables communications uh, between networks without necessarily exposing how the network works internally. That is each of the interconnecting networks. And is cooperatively managed. Uh, the way messages are passed and the way traffic is passed is done through mutual cooperation, not through a regulatory body as it is in the telephone network. The network was not designed, or at least the protocols were not designed to be highly reliable. They were best effort protocols. And in that sense, um, there was no guarantee of connectivity, availability, uh, nor uh, fidelity of delivery, that is, a quality of service as we call it today. Local outages today on the internet happen all the time. It's such a large network, that's not surprising. But globally, it is very resilient. And you can see from the picture uh, some of the qualities that make it resilient. There are many paths through the network. And when one path isn't available, the network devices can discover that and take another path to get to their destination. It, the network has evolved uh, to be a reliable service, even though it wasn't advertised that way, nor was it designed initially to be a high availability uh, network. Uh, but because it is uh, dense and rich in the way the paths are uh, constructed, it is innately reliable. Uh, we haven't had, to my knowledge, a global outage of the Internet uh, in a very long time, except for some planet outages very early in the foundation of the Internet. And the other wonderful part of the evolution is because it is content agnostic, the internet can carry 
uh, multiple modalities of media. That, that is graphics, video, voice, text, and it does it all with equal ease. It is now a part of our social fabric. Uh, 30 years ago, of course, this was not true, but people who are learning to use the Internet today and growing up with uh, mobile devices and uh, video and all of the social implications of the network would be fine to manage their lives without it. So let's look at this network of networks and try to understand uh, how it is put together and why I'm calling it a network of networks. We can all start by relating to our home network. Inside our home, we quite possibly have a desktop computer, a tablet device, and a smartphone, and uh, can also have home monitoring or a wide range of IP devices in our home. That home network is usually connected uh, via an access network uh, for residential users, such as DSL or cable, into an internet service provider. Now, the access networks vary in capability and uh, reliability and the way they operate, but to the home network user, um, many of those differences are hidden. Although there's unique technology in the access network, uh, that technology is hidden because really the boundaries between these three different networks I've shown here, the home network, the access network, and the ISP, are all bridged by IP, uh, the Internet Protocol. And so uh, if you're looking in from inside the home network, you cannot really tell that you're uh, operating on one network versus another. The Internet Service Providers uh, like uh, Comcast or AT&T or Verizon or uh, other operators have access to the broader internet typically through a tier 2 network. The larger internet service providers um, like uh, Comcast and Verizon and AT&T uh, don't need to go through a tier 2 network. Uh, they can connect uh, directly to their tier networks, tier 1 networks, um, or at least AT&T and Verizon can. They both have Tier 1 networks. Tier 1 networks are large optical uh, IP routing networks that interconnect with all the other Tier 1 networks uh, around the world and on an uh, equal peering basis, and they provide interconnectivity to Tier 2 networks and other networks uh, for global reach and, and connectivity. And we're going to talk more about each of these uh, networks later in the courses, but this gives you a roadmap on uh, what the networks look like and how they are interconnected. In turn, the tier networks and also tier 2 networks have connections and peering uh, points where they connect to content providers. So content providers are in hosting centers uh, connected either directly or through a hosting company, uh, and uh, th that is where the content resides uh, in uh, data centers, and uh, so-called cloud services are also uh, available in those data centers. Mobile networks work much the same way in the sense that they are uh, really a collection of two different types of networks. A mobility network, which is a radio network uh, with the cell towers. There are over 100,000 cell towers in the United States, and that a radio network manages the air interface as well as the mobility itself and allows people to go from site to site and maintaining IP connectivity. The mobile network operators collect all that traffic, and then that traffic uh, connects again to the Tier 1 backbone. Uh, IP services that run over these two types of network, mobility and home networks, in general can't tell the difference uh, because this is IP end-to-end. -end. So whether you're getting content from YouTube on your smart device or whether you're getting it on a tablet at home, it's really all the same uh, from the point of view of the content provider. We need to add one more important 
network to this picture and that is the internet peers. Uh, tier 1 networks uh, peer with each other on a settlement free basis. Uh, that means that traffic passes among t Tier 1 backbones uh, without charge. The requirements to be a Tier 1 are that you have to be able to reach every point on the Internet. And uh, in addition to that, Tier 1 uh, network providers have requirements for settlement-free peering. For example, AT&T has the requirement that um, interconnecting tier ones must have backbones uh, at least uh, capable of carrying OC192 traffic, that is 10 gigabits per second. And uh, that requirement was put in place some years ago, so today the requirement might be uh, somewhat greater. In addition, to peer with uh, tier uh, AT&T on a tier one basis, you must interconnect at multiple points within the United States. Uh, that is required so that each network has the ability to hand off traffic at the most efficient point and is not required to haul traffic across the U.S. Uh, simply because the interconnecting peer doesn't have adequate uh, interconnection. So those requirements for Tier 1 interconnection on a settlement-free basis. Connection with Tier 2 networks are on a settlement basis. Now that is negotiated between the uh, network operators. Tier 2 networks tend to have backbone networks, but they uh, don't meet all the requirements of a Tier 1. That is, they don't interconnect with all the other Tier 1s uh, in the world, nor necessarily do they meet the backbone requirements of somebody like an AT&T. ISPs tend to be Tier 3 networks. Uh, these are uh, somewhat informal uh, designations, uh, but um, the Tier 3 networks tend not to have backbones, and they tend to be uh, specific purposes, like the two I've shown, the mobile network operator, which is an aggregation network for radio traffic, and the ISP for the home network uh, aggregates either DSL or cable modem traffic. Now, the symbol uh, I've placed in the uh, aggregation networks is really a symbol for aggregation and concentration. The aggregation and access networks tend to have uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of endpoints in total, and they concentrate that traffic and deliver it on uh, fewer but higher speed uh, connections to the Internet. The other interesting and characteristic about access networks is they tend to be highly asymmetrical. That is, we can expect to see a lot more traffic being delivered to the home than is being originated from the home. Uh, that's because the traffic is generally comes from content providers, uh, video, or uh, other forms of media. The same is true in the mobility network. Mobility networks are highly asymmetrical with more traffic going to the subscriber uh, then comes from the subscriber typically, although the advent of very high density cell phones and cameras uh, is changing that somewhat and we're seeing more and more content uh, coming from the end users. The picture that we look at here, we have to ask ourselves, where is the internet protocol actually being enforced? And the only places we can be guaranteed that the IP protocol, the IP family of protocols are going to be enforced are at the boundaries between the networks. So we can be pretty sure that the boundary between the home network and the access network is an IP uh, related exchange and the ISP connecting to the tier 2 network that enforces the full family of IP protocol uh, protocols in the suites. Same is true of Tier 2 networks, and they're in a connection with Tier 1. Inside each of these networks, inside the Tier 2 network and inside the Tier 1 backbone, there's uh, no requirement to run IP. In fact, we'll, we'll find that different protocols are being uh, run inside these networks. Uh, often they're Layer 2 networks, but in the case of backbones, we'll find there's another protocol called multi-protocol label switching, 
which is very efficient for uh, backbones of scale and also gives the added advantages that it supports uh, multiple edge protocols such as IP, IPv4, and IPv6, which we'll get more into in later sessions. The next slide is simply a list of suggested reading uh, for this uh, session, and in subsequent sessions I'll provide uh, more suggestions for your reading enjoyment.